Hello, we are wanting some gardeners. We are here to talk about gardening, and this is Mid-American Gardener, so thank you for joining us, because I've got some really good experts here who we just love talking about plants and insects and gardening of all types. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll answer questions about perennials and cut flowers. But let's find out who's here and also their expertise so you can direct your questions towards that area. And I'm gonna start first with Dyke Barkley. Hi Dyke. Hello. Uh, my name is Doug Barkley and I teach the horticulture program down at Lakeland College and I'd say my specialty is probably perennials and ornamental grass and I, I would call myself one of those plant geeks as well, a lot of yes. unusual plants. So uh, maybe I start off here with one of the email questions, uh, a question about uh, blueberries. Uh, lives in northern Illinois and they have some blueberries and they say they're five or six years old and they fertilize them and they thought they were watering enough and they weren't really saying the plants look bad, they actually made it sound like the plants look good, but they weren't getting any crops, no insects, no problems. I do know that blueberries need some acid um, in the soil or, or an acid type soil, although I would think you would be having some yellowing or some chlorosis showing up. So I'm just wondering if you do need more water. I know vi uh, viburnums, uh, blueberries need lots of moisture but good drainage. So I would try and get more organic matter mixed in, try and get some soil. My thinking is if the plants aren't growing, then the roots aren't growing, particularly if you're looking at a five-year-old plant not doing anything. So anything, to, if the plant's looking good, then I'm gonna go back and say the roots aren't growing. We either need more moisture, more organic matter to get moisture without being too wet. And uh, another thing is that you don't have blueberry fruit without bugs. Absolutely essential. Okay. So if they're a little short on pollinators, that will eliminate your uh, fruit. But a five-year plant should be growing strong. Should be growing strong. And, and doing well, yeah. So, and it's Although they did, I did look up the cultivar they listed and it only gets 18 inches full grown. So okay. it's a very, very dwarf one. But I, I know the immediate answer is gonna be pH, but if the plants look good, then I'm thinking the roots aren't growing. Yeah. And they often will actually get better fruit if you have another uh, variety that grows, that actually blooms at the same time. So yeah. that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have one, but generally you'll get better fruit that way. Something so. to look into. Yeah. Ask for for well maybe not Christmas but you know. <laughs> uh, every Your holiday wish starting Easter. in May yeah. Easter there you okay, go okay Easter <laughs> all right well yeah, let's Easter. go to our next guest in the middle Sandy Mason hi Sandy hi I'm Sandy Mason I'm with the University of Illinois Extension I'm a horticulture educator and um, I'm probably also a plant geek kind of just like uh, yes. along with Dyke uh, I like a wide variety of plants and always fun but I'm also a tool geek. So that's my other you know, <laughs> thing is I love a good set of pruners. And I think one of the things is, you know, is people, you know, I think about this sometimes, you know, people have, you know, they have a hammer, a screwdriver, a pair of pliers. They should all have a decent set yes. of pruners. It should be just right there in your, in your toolbox, uh, no matter what you're doing. So these are, I think uh, it's great to have these hand pruners. And this is just one of the brands that I think a lot of us uh, like using are the Felco types. And I'm going to tell you right now that I actually bought these when I was was in the Woody Ornamentals class at the University of Illinois. And that might have been just a few years ago. Diane knows that too, that's why I'm looking at her. I have the same pair from uh, when I so took let's it see, three, decades. four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was thinking know. years. <laughs> oh, okay, anyway. So, but, so you can imagine, that's how long these have lasted. I've only replaced one thing on them when the spring fell off one time and I couldn't find it and you can get replacement parts. So they last forever. And also there's just the fact that they have red handles. <laughs> so you, when you put them down, you can find them again. So get a good pair of pruners and, and you deserve it. And they're, they're not horribly expensive. We like these scissor types. Um, and these are the ones that are also called bypass pruners. And they, they work just like scissors where they go past the blade like this. Uh, and we generally don't don't like to, these anvil types and these are the ones that they tend to be a little cheaper but it's actually just a sharpened blade that hits an anvil or flat surface they're really hard to keep sharp um, and they're really they tend to crush the stem so we, we generally don't like them as well so so you know treat yourself and get a good set of pruners and there's there's all kinds of sizes now you can get left-handed ones and so there's no excuse not to have a good set of pruners oh I keep one in the the door of my car and I have one at work See, you and need I have multiple, one in my so, yeah. you always need one in the car. <laughs> but yeah, they're just the best. Yeah. So it's nice to have plant geeks and tool geeks on <laughs> at the same time. Hey, let's go to our third geek. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, geek. let's go to our next expert. <laughs> and Dr. Phil Nixon is next to me. Would you say you are a bug 
geek? Never met a bug I didn't like. Okay, yeah, you're see, a bug there geek. You go. It qualifies. Ticks, yes, but not bugs. <laughs> uh, I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. And tonight I'm going to start out talking about Christmas tree insects. Not ones that are necessarily pests of the trees themselves. There's some of those that the grower takes care of. But when you have your Christmas tree inside for too long, and how long is too long? Probably at least six weeks. Things start hatching out of them. And so we're not supposed to leave a, a, lot, a, a freshly cut tree inside that long be, because they'll dry out and become a fire hazard. But if you do leave them in too long, then you get things such as spider eggs hatching out. And this is a group of, of spider eggs right here at the tip of my finger. And uh, they're white and, and uh, this is kind of a roundish clump. Sometimes they're little fuzzies that have those on there. You leave those too long and you got angel hair big time because <laughs> the spiders, <laughs> leave, spiders will hatch and then they blow on, uh, on pieces of on silk that they produce from tree to tree. And so if they get next to a vent, they're just blowing all over your, your living room or whatever. <laughs> uh, we also have a, have a white pine aphid that will lay its eggs as black eggs along the needles. I don't have one to show. I'd, they're more common in Northern Illinois <coughs> and many of our shipped in trees are gonna be from, uh, from <coughs> Canada and the Northern US and so on. And they will sometimes hatch out in there. And then you get little aphids that drip honeydews kind of a light syrupy solution all over the presence under the tree that kind of adds to the effect. <laughs> you can pick it up and you can't get rid of it. Um, the uh, one that will show up occasionally, and, and actually I got my first call this last year on this and I thought, I thought man, this is, this is neat. Uh, both on spruces and firs, as well as, as pine trees, you will get bagworms and these are, you know, you could, you could paint these nice little colors and put lights on them and they'd be <laughs> ornaments. But, uh, but they have eggs that will hatch out but they take a long time to do this. I got a call last year actually of these things hatching out at, in, the, in the second week of March. This person had had to tree up since around Thanksgiving, which meant that it had to not have any needles on it anymore. I'm sure they dried up and fell off. <laughs> but at any rate, these things will also balloon with, with silk webbing. And this person talked about having this she didn't think she had angel hair on her tree and what all of a sudden she did and it was from these things. <laughs> And then I was out looking this morning, just this is kind of a kind of a neat guy. Uh, I ran across a a uh, butterfly chrysalis uh, looking for looking for insects to bring in to show. You're not likely to have one of these on your tree, but I'm guessing this is probably a red spotted purple. They live they feed on a lot of different low growing plants, and uh, this is actually a butterfly chrysalis. And I'm going to take that home, get it back outside so it doesn't get tricked into being warm for a day. It is and, beautiful. And it's, it will come out as a butterfly, probably about a three and a half inches wide, dark wings with red spots on it, red spotted purple. It's the southern version of a white admiral. So if you're from Michigan or something, white admiral will mean something to you. You know, I think sometimes people don't realize that, that the caterpillars will wander yeah, they, off of their original right. plant, and they'll go to these kind of, sometimes you'll find these like on fence posts or whatever, and it's just because they wandered away. And, then and a natural tendency and for, the, for the caterpillars when they're looking for a place is either they're going to go down and look for some sort of place to hide in what we call the duff of fallen le leaves and so on underneath a tree, or they climb upward, and that's what this one did probably was because they normally feed, I can't remember now what red spotted purples feed on, but it's low growing plants. And this guy was probably, well, you know, if I can get high, I can get better off. So he got literally high. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you may not want your tree in that long. Yeah. The, the, um, the bottom line is don't let this make you think, well, I want to get an artificial tree. No. Because no. buying tr oh. cut trees is supporting Illinois agriculture, Illinois farmers, Illinois bottom line. And uh, and just don't leave them in too long, and you don't have any of these problems. Uh, you know, about time things are ready to hatch, you move the tree outside, and they go. <coughs> that's it. You get and, cold. And I have done several years of ball and burlap trees, and I did them right, and they lived. But I love a fresh Christmas tree. Ooh. Yeah, we have one outside of I our front door. It. It's about 25 feet tall. That was a ball and mm -hmm. burlap one about a, a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have a 30-year-old. Uh, three-story <laughs> tall one that was one of our first ones. Bought, so bought when you were 
real wee tight. <laughs> really? <laughs> <Real> yeah. <tight. laughs> <laughs> At the same time as the Felco. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, well, let's, your second birthday. let's move. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move right along. Let's go to a special Did You Know segment next. Christmas trees are cut weeks before they get to a retail outlet. It is important to get a fresh cut and keep them watered thoroughly when they reach your home. Your home Christmas tree will consume as much as a quart of water per day. We have a Christmas tree theme. That's really good. Okay, let's go to the phone lines next and we're gonna see what Tom has for us, a question on line one. Hi there, Tom. Hi, Diane. I just love your show. It is so smashing. Thank you. Okay, I have two uh, real easy questions for us. One is I'm a, a parts delivery person uh, from here in Decatur from Rush Tracking. I always see when I go to Arthur, I always see the Cox comb uh, that one of the, the people down there that, that works down there. But he got all the flowers come from Germany. And I, the question I want to know is, because they are giant-like mushrooms, and they grow probably somewhere around two or 300 little bitty tiny blooms on this little bitty flower, can these seeds, which he told me, which is, yeah, I've got them in the basement right now, they are dropping like crazy. <laughs> can I replant them and bring them up for renew production? And the other question is, he also had a, I've never seen this pumpkin in my life. It's a starfish pumpkin. Can these pumpkin seeds be cleaned out of the starfish pumpkin and then dried out and then replanted? Okay, let's do the coxcomb seed question first. You want that one? I assume you can as long yeah. as it's an older type and that sounds like it may be. It what you like run it. into with a lot of old flowers, you can collect the seed and that's how it was done for a long time. Some of the newer hybrids and, and cultivars and things are sterile or the seed isn't going to be any good. If you got an old type, yeah, just keep that seed and, and, and it should uh, plant outside. I don't know if I'd start to seed ahead on coxcomb uh, versus just direct sowing. But. And he might just, once he does get it started, just let him drop. I've had coxcomb come up yeah, for... Yeah. six or eight years and I'm just always happily surprised and sometimes I move them to where I do want them not right on the edge but yeah. do, do but they seem like they're still the same as the I think a lot of times of course with a lot of these because they're hybrids or whatever you get these kind of weird they either aren't the same color or maybe there's I, a, I don't know does those seem to be pretty well an Amish red oh, and so okay. it was an old old variety and so in some years when it's growing fast it'll be a plume that will have a little bit of the coxcomb in it or it'll have a coxcomb that has a little bit of a plume. Yeah. Yeah, you know, different colors. I've had them revert to Princess Feather before. Yes. After several years of self-seeding. But that's pretty too. That's yeah. pretty too, you know, yeah. So I don't really but, mind. And then we it. also, we, there was some experimental one, uh, different member, but slows you, same. A real dwarf little one for containers. Yes. Mm -hmm came back from seed next year and got six foot tall this year. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the one thing. You, you yeah, just not, it, is, it, it, yeah. it looked great, but I, you know, the six yeah. foot monster was in the yard all of a sudden where I was expecting a six inch one. But the so. older types stay about two to three feet yeah. high. And of course this I'm trimming a, this them. This was a wheat type of some kind, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, so you okay. just never know. And the now, starfish question. And the starfish pumpkin question. I never heard of that one. I no, but that's gonna be the same thing. Yeah, it, it, it is depends on where it was growing, if it crossed with other pumpkins or not. If it was kind of isolated where it grew, did it, it would be, have its own genetics. But if it mixed with other, if it was grown somewhere where somebody raised a lot of different kinds of pumpkins, it could have crossed up and you wouldn't know that till you planted it and see what you've got. Right, right. And I've tried that one time. I, I found one I really liked and plant. I don't plant very many and it had crossed. I got all these weird little things that wasn't anything like what I wanted. Yeah. Okay. So there you have it beginning. It's an experiment. Uh, beginning plant propagation yeah. uh, answers right there. Okay, let's go to line two next. Joan has a gardenia question. Hi, Joan. Hi. What's your Tell question? Me, I have a lovely gardenia plant and it is growing beautifully, but um, I think it's going to need some kind of grooming uh, or trimming down, and I'm afraid to do that because I don't know which which leaves or which branches should be trimmed down. Could you give me any ideas on that? Okay. So it's actually getting too big? 
I'm sorry. So it's, getting, it's getting too big? I can't hear you. Turn the television can you turn down. Your you audio can hear better. Off. It's kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, the, the Let's one go thing with the credit, fact yeah. that it might be getting yeah, too big. Yeah, it might be getting too big. Uh, the one thing, you, uh, the reason I say that is that gardenias are actually kind of tough to grow yeah. because mm -hmm. they are one of those, they like a high light, but they don't like hot light necessarily. So they don't always like, you know, right there where you get where it's getting a lot of light. Um, they can get some insect problems. Uh, they like to be consistently moist. If they dry out too much, the flower buds will fall off or they're not very happy. Uh, so they're, they're really kind of, pro gardenias are little problem children. So that's why I was a little surprised when yeah. you said, I don't think I've ever bigger. heard somebody ask no. me, yeah, what to do with my gardenias to die, The yeah. plants are trying to die. So you must be doing something wonderfully. Um, <laughs> uh, usually this time of year is not the time of year that we really do a lot of heavy pruning mm -hmm. because we're getting ready, you know, we're right now, it's been so dreary the last few days. And it, you know, until we start getting into March, I really wouldn't do a lot of heavy pruning on it at all. I just enjoy it, uh, do what you're doing already, which is great. And then come March, if you need to do some trimming on it, they actually can take a pretty hard trim and come out of that. So I wouldn't worry about it too, too much till then, really. And, and that's really a pretty good rule of thumb for most house plants is it don't do a lot of trimming on them right now uh, until we get into some hopefully you know, And don't repot them right now. It's yeah, kind of this the is same. Their, you know, we're all kind of going dormant. And, you mm -hmm. know, we are, don't, they are. Right. Just relax. We'll, we'll relax well, for a while. Joan, you with a good yeah, gardenia. Good that her. is, I really think, a first. Uh, so. Keep it up. That sounds yeah, good. Yeah, I've had the best luck with a high light window in a cold room. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't like to be too hot. Right. Okay. Hot. And that's good conservation of resources. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's <really> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to Venus's question about roses on line one. Hi there. What's your rose question? Yes. Uh, okay. This this one here. I have a clippings of the roses, and then I planted it, and then it, it's starting to grow just fine. And then what am I supposed to do winter time just right now around this time? Uh, how do you Is it, in, it So you have it indoors? No, it's outside. Good. <laughs> good. That's actually a good thing. Yeah. That's a, actually good. To get, I think it's fine. Just leave it where it is. I assume it must be in the soil or is it yeah, in it's a... in the soil. Okay, good. I would say that's fine. I, I think probably the biggest thing is that I would just protect it against rabbits because if you have any rabbits around, they love to chew on rose bushes. And if this is a really young one, you wouldn't want that to happen. So if you got a little chicken wire, a little something to sort of protect it a little bit, actually they'll be, it'll be just fine. So And kind of mulch around the base, protect yeah. the root system. I've had a metal, I don't know something what it was. Something a little cage yeah, or something? Yeah, it was a little cage or milk ca yeah. It's an antique, actually. But that, when I have a new plant, then I remember yeah. where it is, <laughs> and critters can't get it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, those wire cages that you use for closets, or I guess they're really kind of baskets, so they use for yeah. closets. Flip those over on top of stuff. That really works out well. So. And you know where it is when it's and a new plant. And you know where it is. It's that's a new right. plant. You don't freak it. Very good. Thank you so for that question. Thing. Well, we're going to go back around to some emails, and I'm going to start back with you, Dyke. All right. Um, this question here uh, emailed in was just asking about lilacs. Somebody had started one. And um, evidently, I don't know if they rooted it from twigs or exactly what they did. They wanted to know if, if it was going to bloom and when they could give it away to his girlfriend. Um, I think you could dig up and move those anytime they're dormant. Either in the fall, we're probably too late now. It's gotten, I assume it's going to get even colder. But when the leaves fall off is a great time in the fall, getting ready to go dormant, kind of around this spring. I think you could dig up, move it. It sounds like it's not very big. Um, and that's probably why it hasn't kicked in and started blooming yet is it's too small. And, uh, it sounds like it just needs some time to get going. Keep in mind, the sooner you can move it, the sooner it'll rebound because digging it up and moving it's going to kind of set it back and delay blooming that way. Okay. But it just needs to get settled and get some strength and size and then it should, <coughs> you shouldn't have to do anything to get it to bloom. All right, very good. Sandy, you're up. I have a question, and really fairly quick, actually. Um, when can you split peony clusters? The question was, they're almost tw 20 years old, which mm. is great. And that's the one thing about peonies, they can last for, uh, you know, really decades, hundreds of years even, I don't know. They last a long time. So you don't have to split them, but what you, the best time to split them is actually in September. They're one of those perennials that we really like to do September as opposed to spring and fall, just to do it that kind of uh, early fall. So September, so you get a little time to do that. They can be split. It. And then the second part of the question was about uh, burning bushes. They wanted to know if they could trim them back. They've gotten to be about 12 feet high. Uh, can they cut them back? It says they got away while they were working. I, I'm assuming that they were working, 
not the burning bushes. So um, <laughs> when to cut them back, uh, I would do this really in the springtime. And you can actually, I've been amazed. Uh, I tried this out one time. I had a 10 foot tall burning bush um, and I wanted to see just how far back, I, and I really didn't care whether it died or not. Uh, so I just wanted to see how far back I could cut it back. And I cut it back to about two and a half feet. And I was amazed it actually came back very well. So I don't know if you've ever done that, if anybody else has ever done that kind of, I wasn't real sure, I thought it'd be okay. Uh, so you can actually do a pretty heavy prune on those and I would do it probably in March or so. I had, I had one that was really doing a lot of die back and so I just cut it straight at the ground. And it, it came back? Now. Yeah. Came oh, right so out. see, I should have been even bolder. When yeah. you don't care, they'll come back. Yeah. When <laughs> you baby them, <laughs> when you baby they them. will die. Cause they I have will just, die. Convince yourself you I have just pruned on yeah. some and yeah. they, but so if you wanted news. it a perfect size and shape, yeah. it would probably die. Yeah. Okay, I'm maybe off base maybe. here, but <laughs> but they're tough. I think yeah, that's what we're saying. Than, yeah, they're tougher than we think. Okay. Well, Phil, you are next. Reader calls it. Uh, watcher calls in about it. Says a red maple that has been in the ground about three years and is about four inches in diameter. Says we recently saw a small insect drop from this hole to the ground, but then couldn't find the insect to identify it. Do we need to be concerned that the tree being so small, whatever boring insect this is, could kill the tree? Thank you. And that's the picture that they sent in. And as you can see, it's kind of a nice looking uh, hole there in the tree. And the, uh, the, this is a trick question. What is the most commonly small insect that's attacked by flathead apple tree borer? Maple, okay? Uh, hmm. This would be flathead apple tree borer, which also attacks trees in the rose family, such as apples and so on when they get old but they like to attack young maple trees. Normally it gets in because the tree has some problems on that side. And this is very likely on the southwest or southwest side of the tree. Being young trees, they are very susceptible to frost cracking, which means that most of the tree is, is frozen and during the winter time, you get sun coming in at a low angle from the southwest or southwest, warms that, gets it up above freezing, the difference in, in temperature will and, and thus shrinkage will cause the bark to crack. And it's a good idea to, you can, to protect that, that side of a tree. If you have the opportunity when you go out to select a tree in a nursery, mark the south side and put that same side to the south when you plant it because the bark will be thicker on that side of a tree, naturally because it had to be, uh, to handle that sort of thing. But uh, you can shade it, uh, you can put, uh, you know, burlap shade over it. Some people will paint it with a 10% white latex paint solution that'll, that'll wear off as the tree gets thicker bark. But that's probably what brought it on. There are some sprays for flatted apple tree borer, but the best thing is prevention by protecting those trees. And this is just a great time to get out there and do that if you've got some young trees, particularly maples. And there's the, it's white also, and it, I guess it's plastic that goes over yeah, trees. And right. it, Shades of trunk and reflects the light both in heat. And yeah. it's not tight to the bark, but right, it's right. really a good shade. You see it mm -hmm. in a lot of nurseries. So but you should take that off when it gets to summertime. Well, people don't. You should. Yeah, and so that's the other thing. Because it will hold moisture against it, and then you're likely to get some fungus growth on that bark underneath that. Particularly plastic doesn't breathe at all, so you can get some moisture but, there. But people will leave breathing. that on, so yeah. that's why I brought it up, because it's plastic and it'll do things. But the good the good uh, idea about marking the south side of the tree, most people don't think to ever think to do that. And of course, when it's already been dug in, in a nursery, you, you can't. You don't have a clue. Yeah. You don't have a clue, but you, yeah. you really do need to know that. Mm -hmm. Flat-headed apple tree borer. On maple. On maple. Yeah. Hmm. I did not <laughs> really know that. Well, let's go to our uh, Mid-American Gardener quiz next. Which vegetable is a cool weather crop? A. Cauliflower. B. Peppers. C. Tomatoes. A. Cauliflower. Both peppers and tomatoes enjoy warmer weather, but cauliflower can really take some frost. Okay, so cool weather, and that could be this coming spring. Well, let's go and do one more, hopefully quick question on line two. Ronald, what is your question, and is it quick? Yes, guys, just uh, about uh, moles. I okay. was wondering if anybody's experienced uh, problems with them this uh, year. I've I've had uh, more moles this fall than oh, I have. Oh, moles, had. okay. Moles. Uh, moles are 
<coughs> are primarily earthworm feeders. They get the reputation of being insect feeders, which they will take advantage of, but a good share of their diet are earthworms, and earthworms are active until that soil temperature drops into below the high 30s, and so they are gonna be active into the fall, get active early in the spring, and so yes, it can be very easy to have mole problems still at this point, and traps are probably the best bet in, in long straight portions of tunnels. Uh, they'll come in and get harpooned to death, and it's a relatively humane way to reduce their numbers. And the good weather and everything seemed to be good for earthworms. Yes, so when right. it's good for earthworms, it's good for moles. Mm, if the earthworms are up, so are the moles. <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's a quick, um, a quick version of what to do for moles besides moving. All right, <laughs> <laughs> we wanna thank each one of you for watching and I wanna thank my plant, tool and bug geeks for being here. <laughs> I call myself a plant geek. And we hope that you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>